Well, thank you to everyone for joining us today. My name is Bob Nichols. I'm a partner in the Labor and Employment Group at Bracewell here in Houston, Texas. I've practiced labor and employment law exclusively for employers for 35 years. I'm here with one of my very bright colleagues, Meredith Grant, who also is a full-time management side labor and employment lawyer. Meredith and I have had to spend a lot of time, post-pandemic in particular, on the issue of when our clients have to grant a remote work request as an ADA accommodation. Certainly, remote work as a whole has been a hot, hot topic, most significantly, perhaps because employees in many businesses and organizations have been pushing for the opportunity to continue to work remotely. Some employers have been trying to push employees back to work more. So that's been a hot, hot policy decision, and it's all tied up in things like the job market and how forceful employers think they can be about returning people to work. Meredith and I are talking about the remote work in the context of a particular statute, a federal law, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And when it compels, requires an employer to grant remote work as a reasonable accommodation when the employer otherwise would not allow it under their normal practices or policies. Let me talk just briefly about the ADA because the history is a little bit important here. The ADA was passed in 1990. The employment provisions in Title I became effective on July 26, 1992. Think about where we were at that point in time. There was no Windows 95. There certainly was nothing like an iPhone or smartphones. It was a technologically a completely different and relatively rudimentary world. To give you a sense for how different, as a result, the view of remote work was at that time, and what the view of in the past 20 years has been of the courts, and frankly, the last 30 years, with regard to remote work as an ADA accommodation for the most part, I want to talk about a 1995 decision to start a little bit. And in particular, the decision in this case was written by, by Judge Posner. Those of you who are attorneys probably remember Judge Posner. Chicago law professor, chief judge of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, very scholarly, very well thought of, and also had very strong feelings about issues. The case at issue involved a woman named Lori Van Zant. She was 35 years old. She was a paraplegic early in her life. She'd had a tumor at the base of her spine, which made her unable to use her body below her waist. As is the case with some paraplegics or quadriplegics, she had a terrible difficulty with ulcers sores caused by her immobility. And that made it hard for her to come to work all the time because the treatment of those ulcers required her to be at home. She worked for the housing division of the state of Wisconsin. She was a state employee. She was a program assistant. In October 1992, just three months after the employment provisions of the new Americans with Disabilities Act became effective, she asked for the opportunity to work at home full time and asked that the that the agency provide her with a computer that she could work at at home. Her job involved mostly computer work. She did some paperwork. She had some responsibility putting some things in the mail, but she was mostly creating content on a computer at work. The state of Wisconsin, her the agency involved said no, or that seems unreasonable, we're not going to do it. She filed suit in federal court and a federal judge, Judge Crabb, in Wisconsin throughout her case, saying that it was unreasonable to expect the employer to allow her to perform her job from home, recognizing that it appeared that she would not be able to perform the, all of the essential functions there. That grant of summary judgment against her was appealed to the Seventh Circuit. Judge Posner wrote the Seventh Circuit's decision in that case. And Judge Posner did not take a favorable view of the concept of working from home. He noted that most jobs in organizations, public or private, involve teamwork under the supervision rather than solitary, unsupervised work. And teamwork under supervision generally cannot be performed at home without a substantial reduction in the quality of the employee's performance. Judge Posner went on to indicate that an employer is not required to allow disabled workers to work at home where their productivity inevitably would be greatly reduced. And with regard to the request by the plaintiff that the issue of the reasonableness of working from home as a reasonable accommodation be submitted to the jury, Judge Posner brushed that aside, stating no jury could, in our view, be permitted 
to stretch the concept of reasonable accommodation so far. What is really interesting about Judge Posner, again, a really smart judge and law professor, is he did see the writing on the wall in terms of the future. Because he said in that decision in 1995, he specifically conceded that at some point in the future, the impracticality of work from home, quote, will no doubt change as communication technology advances, close quote. And as we all know, it did advance rapidly. But what did not advance rapidly was the views of the federal courts, their skepticism about remote work as an ADA reasonable accommodation. For example, the Sixth Circuit in 2015, now we're getting relatively close to that period before the pandemic, the Sixth Circuit wrote in the Ford Motor case, quote, much ink has been spilled establishing a general rule that with few exceptions, an employee who does not come to work cannot perform any of his job functions, essential or otherwise. A sort of a damning view of remote work. Our Fifth Circuit, by our I mean covering Texas where I live and work, as well as Louisiana and Mississippi, the Fifth Circuit said in the Credure case in 2017, quote, there is a general consensus among courts, including ours, that regular work attendance, work site attendance, is an essential function of most jobs. Well, as we all know, the earth uh, shook in March of 2020 with the onset of the COVID pandemic, and it changed a lot of things, including views about remote work. And I'm going to turn things back to Meredith to tell us about that game-changing event and how it affected remote work as an ADA accommodation. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, the COVID-19 pandemic definitely brought many changes to the workplace, as we all know. And among other things, it was a game changer for remote work as an ADA reasonable accommodation. And this is definitely demonstrated in case law in recent years. So let's talk about the practical impact that the pandemic work from home situation had on the ADA analysis using case law. There's one big case from late last year out of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. And although it's not a COVID case, it really, we think, encapsulates the move that courts are making towards viewing remote work as a potential reasonable accommodation. And this is Mobley versus St. Luke's Health System out of Missouri. Joseph Mobley and the plaintiff in this case, he was a patient access supervisor at St. Luke's in Missouri, and he had a history of positive performance reviews. And St. Luke's actually had a policy of allowing supervisors like Mobley to work remotely two days per week. But occasionally, his supervisor would allow her reports to work remotely more often than that. So Mobley was working remotely from time to time. Ultimately, Mobley was diagnosed with MS, sadly. And about a year later, he requested a reasonable accommodation from his supervisor. And essentially what he wanted was the discretion to work remotely during these MS flare-ups without having to get permission from his supervisor. But Mobley's request was ultimately denied. He was told that he could use FMLA leave or PTO during his MS flare-ups instead. Mobley, a few months later, renewed that request, but this time he provided a doctor's note recommending that he be able to work remotely. St. Luke's again denied his blanket request, but St. Luke's did tell him that he could ask his supervisor for permission to work remotely on a case-by-case basis when he had these MS flare-ups. Ultimately, there was only one instance where Mobley's supervisor denied his request to work from home during a flare-up. And on that one case, he used PTO instead. So a few months later, Mobley resigned from St. Luke for fear that he was going to lose his job over his medical condition. And then he sued St. Luke's for disability discrimination, among other things, alleging that St. Luke's had failed to accommodate his disability. And the district court out of Missouri granted summary judgment for St. Luke's, finding that Mobley had failed to demonstrate that, number one, he could perform the essential functions of his job with or without a reasonable accommodation. And number two, he failed to show that St. Luke's did not engage in the interactive process in good faith. Um, And on appeal, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals actually disagreed and found that there was a genuine dispute of material fact as to whether Mobley could perform all the essential job functions with his proposed accommodation of working from home whenever he had an MS flare-up. And this is really important. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals here stated, quote, by allowing Mobley to consistently work remotely, aside from his medical condition, St. Luke's implicitly demonstrated a belief that he could perform his essential job functions without being in the office all the time. Moreover, while working remotely, Mobley continued to receive positive performance reviews, reflecting that he was able to effectively supervise his employees despite not being on site. 
So St. Luke's was basically trying to argue that as a patient access supervisor, Mobley's job required in-person supervision. But the Court of Appeals actually found that St. Luke's pointed to no real evidence to back that up. The Court of Appeals, nevertheless, still affirmed summary judgment for St. Luke's because it found that St. Luke's had engaged in the interactive process in good faith. And although St. Luke's didn't grant Mobley's exact accommodation request, which would have been a blanket permission to work remotely anytime he had an MS flare up, St. Luke's went about 90% of the way towards what Mobley wanted, and they allowed him to request work from home on a case-by-case basis. And as I mentioned earlier, his supervisor did allow him to do that most of the time, all except that one occasion where he just was able to use paid time off. So St. Luke's was really working with Mobley here. So there are two big takeaways from the Mobley case that we really want to emphasize today. Number one, an employer's track record of allowing employees to work remotely is highly relevant to ADA cases stemming from subsequent denials of remote work requests. And this is an important point for many employers, and I'm sure for many of you, because during the pandemic, so many employees were permitted or even required to work from home for a period of time and sometimes even a really extended period of time. And of course, now that history of allowing remote work will now be relevant to courts and future ADA cases. So this is really important. And the second big point we want to emphasize is that the interactive process really is key in defending ADA failure to accommodate claims. And this is demonstrated by the Mobley decision, where, as we saw, St. Luke's didn't give Mobley the accommodation he wanted, but ultimately St. Luke's still won the case because it engaged with Mobley in the interactive process and it really made an effort to work with him. So even if the employer is ultimately going to deny these remote work accommodation requests, it's critical that they be able to show that they engaged in a good faith interactive process with the employee. And the position taken by the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in that Mobley case It's consistent with the EEOC's current guidance with regard to remote work as an ADA reasonable accommodation. During the pandemic, as many of you might recall, the EEOC issued some updated guidance on COVID-19 and the ADA, and they provided some really key points for employers who are now dealing with increasing remote work ADA accommodation requests. Importantly, in that guidance, the EEOC provided that the period of providing telework because of the COVID-19 pandemic could serve as a trial period that showed whether or not this employee with a disability could satisfactorily perform all essential functions while working remotely. And the employer should consider any new requests in light of this information. So for better or worse, we can't go forward in the ADA context and completely ignore the fact that so many employees did work from home for months or even years in some circumstances during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the EEOC has now very clearly taken the position that employees' experiences working remotely during that time period are going to be relevant moving forward in evaluating future reasonable accommodation requests. So say an employee had previously made a request to work remotely as an accommodation pre-pandemic, and that request was denied because the employer felt that the employee just couldn't perform their job from home. But then, as with so many others, that individual was required to work from home during the pandemic. And then later on, once everyone returned to working in the office full time, say that employee renews their request to work from home as an accommodation. So in that case, the EEOC now advises that in considering the employee's renewed request to work from home, the employer must consider that employee's past experience work from home during the pandemic. Now, of course, this is not to say that employers are automatically required to grant these remote work accommodation requests now simply because the employer allowed work from home during the pandemic. In fact, the EEOC stated in its updated guidance, quote, the fact that an employer temporarily excused performance of one or more essential functions when it closed the workplace and enabled employees to telework for the purpose of protecting their safety from COVID-19 or otherwise chose to permit telework does not mean that the employer permanently changed a job's essential functions or that telework is always a feasible accommodation or that it does not pose an undue hardship. These are fact-specific determinations. So again, the ADA does not require employers to excuse any essential job functions as an accommodation. So just because the employer may have temporarily excused certain essential job functions during the pandemic when it had no choice and it sent everyone home during COVID, that does not mean that employers are obligated to keep doing that moving forward. Um, But of course, it's still clear that the COVID-19 work from home experience is now a really important consideration to the analysis. So the game really has changed for better or for worse. And that's the reality we now live in. 
And I'm going to turn it back to Bob, who's going to tell us more about the practical impact that the COVID-19 pandemic had on remote work in the ADA context. Meredith, as we discussed, another reason we are not going back to the previous view of remote work as an ADA reasonable accommodation is the manner in which the American workforce, the makeup of that workforce changed during the pandemic. There was a fascinating Los Angeles Times article from Christmas Day 2022, where they pointed out that the employment of disabled persons during the pandemic increased 25%, and that the unemployment rate among the disabled dropped from 12.3% to 5.8%, dropped by more than half during the pandemic. And the primary reason for that is, as some of you know, there are quite a number of people who in this country who historically have been homebound because of medical reasons. They can't get to a work site. Maybe they have mobility issues or other concerns that don't allow them to travel to work, medical concerns. And, and in this country, those people have generally subsisted on SSI and Social Security disability benefits. Well, something that's really very nice and important is a lot of those people went to work during the pandemic in remote jobs. And it demonstrates the importance of remote work as an accommodation for the disabled. And it further points out that we simply are not going back. We cannot go back to the pre-pandemic view, skeptical view of remote work as an ADA accommodation. So in a nutshell, what you're hearing from Meredith and I is that the pandemic, together with technology improvements, have fundamentally changed the landscape. And remote work as an ADA accommodation, not always, but not infrequently, is going to be something that businesses have to deal with. A state court of appeals in California summed this up rather succinctly in a 2022 decision, saying, quote, as a result of advances in technology and the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, working remotely is no longer an infrequently conferred perquisite, but an increasingly common and necessary adaption to the demands of modern life. I'm going to turn things back to Meredith now to talk to you a little bit about how the concept of remote work as an ADA accommodation works within the normal ADA analytical framework. Meredith? Thanks, Bob. So yeah, let's step back a bit and talk about how remote work accommodation requests fit within the broader ADA analysis. In 2003, the EEOC issued guidance on, quote, work at home or telework as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. And while those terms are certainly dated now, this guidance still provides a really great framework for the analysis, and it's still very much applicable. And and that guidance, um, which of course predated the pandemic, the EEOC said that even if an employer does not have an existing telework program, changing the location where work is performed may fall under the ADA's reasonable accommodation requirement of modifying workplace policies even if the employer does not allow other employees to telework. So, you know, really, we're just changing the location where the job is performed. And it really doesn't matter if the employer lets others work remotely or not. Um, This is an accommodation that, according to the EEOC, would definitely apply under the ADA. And so then the question becomes, how should an employer determine whether someone really needs to work from home as an accommodation? And as with all other ADA reasonable accommodation requests, this determination must be made through a flexible interactive process that begins with the employee's request. Um, So the employee is going to first need to inform the employer that they have a medical condition that requires some change in the way their job is performed. And just as a reminder here, employees do not need to use any special words such as ADA or reasonable accommodation in making these requests. They really just need to let the employer know that a medical condition interferes with their ability to do their job. At that point, the employer and the individual need to discuss the individual's request so that the employer understands why the disability might require working from home. So have HR sit down with the employee and really talk this through. Ask the employee what they want, what their desired accommodations may be, why they think those accommodations will help them perform the essential functions of their job. And at this point, the employee definitely needs to explain the precise limitations that make it difficult for them to do their job in the workplace and how they believe their job can still be performed from home. And remember, employers may request information about the individual's medical condition, such as a doctor's note, 
if it's unclear whether there really is a disability as defined under the ADA. You may also want to discuss other types of accommodations that you believe would allow the employee to remain full time in the workplace if that's your goal. But in some situations, the EEOC makes clear that working from home might be the only effective option for an employee with a disability. But of course, employers are still not obligated under the ADA to grant the employee's desired request if another equally effective option exists. And we're going to touch more on that in a moment. And lastly, even if remote work is the only potential accommodation, the employer is not obligated to grant that request. The employer might still be able to reject that request if either the employee can't perform the essential functions of their job from home or if permitting that accommodation would impose a true undue hardship on the employer. And in the ADA context, an undue hardship generally means significant difficulty or expense on that particular employer. And we're not just talking here about financial difficulty. The EEOC also recognizes that accommodations might pose an undue hardship if they're unduly extensive or substantial disruptive, or if they fundamentally alter the nature or operation of the business. Um, But undue hardship is sort of a high burden, and these need to be decided on a case-by-case basis. And I'm going to turn it back to Bob now to talk a little bit more about the interactive process. Thank you, Meredith. As the Mobley case and so many ADA cases demonstrate, whether you win or lose an ADA case, sometimes not so much about the final result you reach, but the process. Did you appear? Did you, in fact, make a strong effort to work with the employee and your organization to find an accommodation that will work for that employee? And employers who, sensing that it's futile, skip that process, do so at their own peril in terms of the federal courts. So what's the process? What's, what's an effective interactive process? First of all, you have to train your supervisors and managers to know that when an employee makes a request for some adjustment, whether it be remote work or otherwise, or accommodation or special treatment because of a physical or mental health concern, they've got to go to HR right away. Department heads, line supervisors are not in a position to conduct the interactive process on their own. HR and sometimes legal have to, you know, they've got to drive the boat. So you have to train your supervisors and managers to come to you, HR professionals, employment law professionals, and then you need to guide the interactive process to a successful conclusion. You gather information from the employee. You have discussions with the employee. Discussions with the employee don't mean email exchanges or text exchanges. They mean real discussions, if not in person on the telephone or via Teams or what have you. But you've got to do that. Employers want to skip that sometimes because it's uncomfortable. It's distasteful. Maybe they don't like the employee and they're busy. You can't do it. You've got to have actual discussions with the employee to have a meaningful interactive process. You can and should consider getting information from the employee's healthcare provider. You don't go to the healthcare provider directly. You can pose questions that the employee takes to the healthcare provider, and then the employee brings the information back from the healthcare provider for you. You should consult with other key internal stakeholders, brainstorm. Sometimes, much to your surprise, you come up with a solution, maybe a solution that doesn't involve remote work, but still is an equally effective accommodation. You want to document your interactive process. You want HR to do it. Interestingly enough, when I say document the process, You don't want the back and forth with supervisors and managers to occur by email. You want to do this process with them through conferences. Why? Because with these email exchanges, invariably, there's some comment in one of those strings that we deeply regret a supervisor having made, maybe expressing skepticism, impatience about the individual or the individual's request. So have those interactive process conferences live. So key things you have to be answered is, does the employee actually have a medical impairment that requires, that may constitute a disability? Simply saying, I want to work from home because I'd rather do that, doesn't implicate the ADA. And can the employee actually perform the essential functions with remote work? If remote work's not going to be effective in solving the problem, you don't have to offer it. And Meredith has already effectively explained to you the undue hardship concept. And also, as she alluded to, if you can come up with an alternative accommodation that's equally effective, you have the right to choose that over remote work. That's not always the case, but sometimes it'll occur. For example, maybe you have an employee who says, I need to work remotely because it takes me an especially long time to get to work on mass transit because of my disability. Well, maybe you can adjust their schedule. 
right? Maybe an employee wants remote work because they say they have a suppressed immune system and they're worried about becoming infected with some contagious disease at work or illness. Well, maybe you can provide them with a private office. Maybe you can provide them with a cubicle away from others. There are other solutions that often are effective besides work from home, and you have to explore those. Let's talk about, before we finish, some practical guidance generally about how you deal with these issues. As you can tell, you have to have an overhaul company approach and procedure with regard to remote work. If you handle remote work on a completely ad hoc basis, you let individual supervisors and managers do what they want, you can see that you're often going to undermine any potential defense to an ADA claim for remote work beyond what you would normally allow because you're going to have inconsistency. You're going to say, Mary can't do her essential functions at home, but guess what? Some manager lets someone else in the same job work from home already. So you've got to have a coherent, and systematic approach to how your company views remote work generally and within particular job positions. And again, you got to involve HR in doing this. Individual supervisors, managers are not competent to handle this problem. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to be inconsistent. HR and employment law professionals in the organization have to manage this. By the way, consider the significance of job descriptions If a job description in an honest and effective way reflects facts that would indicate that remote work would prevent performance of the essential functions, that job description can be an exhibit that can be helpful in a fight over whether you were proper in denying a remote work as a a reasonable accommodation. Again, we covered the fact you want to do this through actual conferences and you don't want to do the interactive process through emails or text messages. Again, even if you think it's going to be futile, still go through the interactive process. Remember to solicit information from the employee and potentially the healthcare provider. Remember that if remote work will not be effective to address the employee's in particular concern, you don't have to do it. Just because they have a disability and would like to work from home doesn't mean they get to work from home. The working from home has to effectively accommodate the situation such that they can now perform the essential functions of their job. And remember, if you can solve that problem with an alternative reasonable accommodation that's equally effective and more to your liking, you can do that. I'm going to turn things back to Meredith for a few quick final remarks and we'll let you go for today. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, a few more things. And one of these we touched on earlier, but it is really important for employers to remember that the ADA does not require them to eliminate an employee's essential job functions as an accommodation. So when an employee is asking to work from home as an accommodation, if you really think that they can't perform all of their essential job functions from home, you don't have to allow them to do that. The ADA does not require that, even if the employer previously did that and waived certain essential job functions during the pandemic when they sent everyone home. However, if the employer does opt to temporarily excuse one or more essential job functions in allowing an employee to work from home as a reasonable accommodation, it is very important that this be documented. So this means that the employer needs to communicate to the employee that it will temporarily excuse the performance of XYZ essential job functions, but that by doing so, the employer is by no means suggesting that the job can be fully performed from home. You really want to maintain good documentation of this position from the get-go because you really don't want to find yourself in a tough spot later on down the road trying to get the employee to return to the office and then them asking, well, why? I've been able to perform all of my job functions from home. You never raised this issue with me before. So make sure you've got that documented from the beginning. Um, And with that, also be sure to maintain strong documentation of any performance issues that might pop up as a result of an employee working from home as an accommodation. Um, Another really important piece of practical advice that we want to drive home is do not forget to ask the employee's healthcare provider for a finite time limit on the need for their remote work as an accommodation. So from the get-go, have the employee obtain information from their healthcare provider about the anticipated end date for their need to work from home. Do not just grant open-ended or indefinite remote work requests. This is definitely going to cut against any later argument by the employer that the accommodation poses an undue hardship or is unreasonable. And that'll be really useful down the road. Even if you anticipate that you will end up extending their remote work request as needed, definitely try to get that finite time period spelled out. And lastly, this is something we sometimes forget, but always remember that if an employee tells you they cannot perform their job on site as normally required, this could trigger the employer's obligations under the Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, This isn't just an ADA issue, so keep that in mind. And Bob, any final thoughts? No, I think you covered it nicely, Meredith. We hope you found our talk helpful today. You'll gain access to our presentation 
through an email that you'll receive in the coming days in case you want to watch it again or share it with people. Again, we hope you all have a great day and thank you for joining us.